Hi, everybody. Hope you're all doing well in the, the peak of this pandemic. Um, so I am here today to talk about a landslide susceptibility analysis that I generated of the Wallbridge fire area, which is a kind of like a subdivision of the LNU lightning complex. Um, <clears throat> so let's get going here. Okay, so I just want to do outline my objective. Um, the purpose of the project is to evaluate the susceptibility of landslides to occur within an area that has experienced an unconventional loss of vegetation due to wildfire activity. Uh, pretty straightforward. So the <clears throat> LNU lightning complex uh, was a fire that included uh, well, it was eight fires. It was a, a zone. A, uh, it included the Hennessy, the Gamble, the 10-15, the Spanish, the Markley, the 13-4, the 11-16, and of course the Wallbridge fire. Uh, what you're looking at here, <clears throat> kind of in the center of the screen, is the Wallbridge fire burn area which is the focus of my study. Um, <clears throat> so this happened in Northern California Bay Area in the county of Sonoma, which you see in on the right-hand side is the Hennessy Fire, and that's actually in Napa County, but we're gonna focus on the Wallbridge Fire, which is over on the left. And uh, it affected five counties, um, that you guys might know or refer to as wine country. Um, <clears throat> so the total burn area of the LNU complex was 363, 220 acres. It destroyed 1,491 structures. Six people were killed. Uh, and it's the fourth largest wildfire in California's recorded history. Uh, I actually lived in Sonoma County for about 10 years, and I was there when this one started in kind of like a highly unusual event that was a, um, <clears throat> a thunderstorm swept through the area with very little precipitation, but a lot of lightning activity. And um, <clears throat> it was the result of a tropical storm called uh, FOSTO, and it's estimated that 10,800 lightning strikes were went down in a 72-hour period, um, presumably sparking 376 known fires. So <clears throat> this area we're going to be focusing on, which is a little bit smaller, 55,000 acres, roughly. And uh, 293 structures were destroyed. Uh, <clears throat> so there's no topology on this map, but I'll, I'll tell you, it's a uh, very steeply sloping wooded hillside terrain, which makes it pretty difficult when it comes to fighting this kind of thing. And it happened in October, which is typically a very windy time of year and also before we got any rain so it was very dry brush out there um <clears throat> so uh that that's kind of the those are the main factors that allowed it to grow to such a large area um it's approximately 12 miles in the north south direction and 10 and a half miles in the east to west direction. Um, <clears throat> it's bordered by, as you can see, Lake Sonoma uh, by the, in the north end, and uh, the city of Healdsburg would be to the east. Uh, the south boundary is a, a river called the Russian River, and the west side is just pretty much wooded forest terrain. Um, and still steeply sloping and, and hillside terrain. So, uh, 
Uh, just a little background on Sonoma County. Uh, Sonoma County is mainly a mixed use, industrial, agricultural, uh, residential, and rural land. Uh, it's roughly got a population of about 500,000, uh, according to a 2019 census. And uh, place I called home for about 10 years, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, so I wanted to get into what my credentials are. I have a background in geology. I got a bachelor's degree in geology. And uh, of the 10 years that I lived there, I spent about five of them working as a geologist in a geotechnical engineering and consulting firm. So landslides were actually a pretty significant part of my job uh, doing landslide analysis. And even just within that five years, I noticed that the county really started to crack down on uh, the, the, the way in which we delineated the landslides, and, uh, put setbacks for the landslides in terms of new construction. And uh, <clears throat> like when I first got there, it was, you pretty much walked the land, looked for areas of erosion, any kind of feature, over overly steep features, something like that. And uh, you, you, it was a lot of eyeballing it. And, and uh, by the time I left it, it turned into a big old report that we had to produce. So, um, <clears throat> so wildfires are a, a pretty common thing where I lived. Uh, I, I did a lot of work, especially with the 2017 fire storm that we had out there in terms of uh, reconstruction and geological reconnaissance and uh, core sampling. Um, this photo here on the right is uh, a vineyard study that I was doing. That was actually a pretty crazy day because there was a uh, there was a cougar out there that had <laughs> taken down some pretty big prey. So constantly looking at my back, and uh, I mean. I, uh, I was there for a lot of these wildfires. It's a family photo uh, taken at the time of the 2017 fire storm. So um, <clears throat> just kind of hits home. But the thing that we lacked in a lot of our analysis and our study of these wildfires was uh, the component of GIS. So when this whole project came up, I, I kind of jumped on that as a, uh, that's a main field of interest. So, um, so I wanted to get into landslides and susceptibility. Uh, maybe just define a landslide, um, just as a very vague definition. It's a sudden displacement of a mass of earth, and landslides could go for miles. They could be miles and uh, they could just be very local and we, we, we differentiate the two by calling them a, a local phenomena or a global phenomena and uh, <clears throat> frequently they you find one landslide where you find a lot of landslides and that has to do with terrain, uh, precipitation, seismic activity, uh, <clears throat> Uh, cohesion of the soil, um, a lot of things like that. Uh, so the susceptibility of a landslide is a reference to the probability of one occurring within a defined spatial reference. Uh, my focus was on the Wallbridge area, so that would be my spatial reference. And this is actually an area due to the geology uh, that is extremely susceptible to landsliding. And that <clears throat> what happened was we had the North American plate here, and we had something called the Farallon plate, which slipped underneath and rose up a bunch of sea levels. So you've got, 
you've got this massive amount of uh, seafloor shelving that basically rose up. Oh, dang, five minutes. All right, <laughs> I got to move on. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, precipitation, topography, geology, soil saturation, these are issues. Uh, these are some photos I took. The one on the left actually has somebody's bedroom right outside. That's a landslide that happened in the middle of the night while they were sleeping. Um, uh, so first off, I had to identify my burn scar boundary. Uh, I did this using multispectral imagery from the Operation Land Imager on the Landsat 8 satellite. Uh, yeah, I obtained that through the USGS, and I did an NBR on it, um, which was just taking the short wave infrared two and the near infrared, and subtracting them, dividing them, and by the additional total. And then I did that for 2019 in October and 2020 in October post fire just to get a, a change and have a reference. And um, <clears throat> so that that gave me my burn severity and I, a burn scar, which I was able to use this FireMon program from the USGS to generate a burn scar boundary from. Uh, then it came to processing the terrain data. So I used one meter bare earth LIDAR data from the Sonoma County Vegetation Mapping and LIDAR program. Sonoma County is very good about uh, having GIS data available to the public. Um, and I used the slope tool in a three by three cell moving window and reclassified it from zero to 90 degrees. <clears throat> Then I put it into five different index values and labeled it from very low to very high sloping. Uh, so next up, I took high spatial resolution multispectral imagery data from Sentinel-2 mission, which was obtained through the uh, uh, Copernicus Open Access Hub. And uh, has 13 bands, uh, spectral bands, and ranging from 10 to 60 meter resolution. I did an NDVI, uh, just took the, you know, like like it says, and NIR, subtracted by the R, and yeah, you, you got that. And uh, <clears throat> I reclassified all that into five different categories as well. And I did the same thing with rainfall data, which I collected for the area uh, through the um, <laughs> it's the, uh, uh, the, it's the uh, open atlas, living atlas. That's what it was. Yeah. And uh, that was mean rainfall for a year. And then I went on to combine all these index values into a weighted sum. And I really wanted to see what the difference in vegetation did to the area. So I assigned the, uh, the reclassed NDVI to a two and all the others went to a one because I wanted that to be my driving factor in my analysis. Um, <clears throat> and so, the result, I did that for 2019, October 2019 and October 2020. And you can see the result uh, is my landslide susceptibility maps and in the 2020 image, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that it's quite a bit more susceptible to landsliding at that point. So I just made a little pie chart that describes the difference and there's almost a 10 percent increase in the very high category of susceptibility for the 2020 image as compared to the 2019 image um this is the model i i used uh, uh the tiff over there is just my um 
raster data, uh, recalculate the slope. And then I, I did all this for 2019 and 2020 in the aim that hopefully somebody could take that raster calculator and take this whole model and reuse it for a different area. Um, okay. <laughs>